Sure, I was just going to say, and I'm putting it into the Zoom chat, if you don't have the uh, Carpentries Etherpad open, it'd be great just so we know who we have here with us uh, this morning. Uh, there's a section you'll notice there saying roll call and check in. Um, you know, it's, it's not obligated, but uh, just so we have a better idea of the, the people with us on the call, if you also want to possibly, you know, add in um, the institution or affiliation you have, um, that, that would be great as well. And I think I'm actually going to hand it over to, to Rachel now um, to, to get things started once we have everyone. Okay, hi everyone, welcome to the panel. Um, and in today's session, we are going to go over making a case for Carpentries uh, membership at your institution. We'll walk you through some of our experiences uh, bringing Carpentries to the University of Toronto. Uh, in the Etherpad, I've also listed a couple notes about our institution, just to give you some context about uh, what our institution is like, how many libraries we have, and the different types the population that we serve. Um, we've got, as of 2019, uh, 93,000 students that are enrolled at our institution. And we are actually split across three different campuses. So each one of us all are uh, representative, representatives from different campuses. Um, uh, so we have a tri-campus system, 44 libraries across these three campuses. and. The very first thing I'd like to dive into is introductions uh, from each of the panelists, provide a little bit of uh, context about where, where their perspectives are coming from, and uh, we'll dive into the questions right after. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Sarah if you want to give a little intro and then we'll get into the discussion. Sure. Uh, as it says in, can everyone hear me? If, if not, just put it into the chat. I see some nodding. Thanks, Kyla. Uh, so I work at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, that's our eastern campus, and uh, I'm a scholarly communications and a liaison librarian there. So I've done quite a bit of teaching uh, at the institution, and I'd heard a lot about carpentries in passing, but honestly, I didn't really look into it further because, you know, I was always busy with something else happening. And it was when the university decided to pursue, or more actually, the, the library decided to pursue a membership and offer the instruction training um, at our institution that I got really excited. And as I started looking into it more and more, uh, I'd say what really appealed to me about Carpentries was the participative approach that Carpentries takes to lessons and lesson planning. Um, in our library's digital scholarship unit. We're very big on open source uh, development. So I really like how the lessons um, are community driven and they're developed and main maintained collaboratively uh, on GitHub. And just kind of where I've been involved within Carpentries then, so since participating in the instructor training uh, last summer downtown, uh, I've uh, become a certified instructor. I went through the checkout process in the fall, and then I proceeded to help our local team at Scarborough plan a library carpentries workshop that occurred this past January at our campus. And there I co-taught, and I also uh, was a helper in the other sessions uh, where I wasn't uh, instructing. And many of us on the panel uh, were involved in, in that session there at Scarborough too. So. Uh, very exciting for me to actually put my my training to use right away. And I'd say I'd continue to uh, check out the Carpentry Slack channels and other communications to stay involved, as well as we have a local Carpentries listserv. And through that, I volunteered to assist in another Carpentries workshop uh, later this month. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'd like to ask Angel to introduce herself. Hey, thanks, Rachel and Sarah. Hi, I'm Angel. I'm a very recent graduate from the University of Toronto's Master of Information program. Um, I'm also a metadata intern with Talent, the Toronto Academic Library Internship Program at the Central Campus. I learned about Carpentries from my colleague Jordan, who got certified and told me lots of great things about it. And then um, I volunteered as a helper for an open refine workshop. And I really learned more about what makes it so special and different how the curriculum is just really well 
really well written and well delivered by quality instructors. And luckily for me, there was uh, training happening in the summer. And so I became, I received my certification last fall and taught my first workshop back in January. And the reason I became involved in the carpentry was because I felt that learning how to teach technical skills would just be a really valuable skill to have in my professional life. And it'd just be a really wonderful way to help out in the community. Thank you, Angel. Uh, Kyla, could you give a little introduction about yourself? Sure, hi, um, I'm Kyla. I'm a metadata librarian um, at the University of Toronto at the downtown campus um, in our main library building. Um, I came to Carpentries uh, first as a student. Um, there were some projects I needed to work on where some technical skills would have been super helpful. Um, and my supervisor recommended these courses. They were happening in a nearby town. So I took the bus and I went um, and I learned a lot and I really liked the learning environment that they set up for us. Um, so uh, yeah, so when the opportunity to do the instructor training came along, um, I signed up because uh, I think that's a really, it just offers a really great perspective on uh, learning these teaching and learning these technical skills. Awesome. Thank you, Kyla. Uh, and lastly, me. Uh, my name is Rachel and I'm an application programmer analyst at the University of Toronto Libraries. Um, I started with the Carpentries uh, coming from a non-traditional background in technology. I actually have a background in social sciences and humanities, so I could really see myself in a learner's shoes in coming from a non-technical background and then having to learn technical skills. I knew that it was a challenge. Um, and when I learned about the Carpentries, I was just so drawn to the vision of it being a, a very diverse and inclusive environment that uh, makes learning fun and accessible. Um, and I got training in late 2018, uh, became a certified instructor, and then came back to the University of Toronto after training and was super pumped to figure out how we could bring Carpentries to the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm just actually gonna uh, walk us through the first question uh, for our panelists here. And that would be, why did we pursue a membership? So uh, I will give a little spiel about how it all started at the University of Toronto. Uh, there are a couple of facts listed in the etherpad about our institution, but we are quite large with 44 branches of libraries. Um, but we knew right away that Carpentries, it was a super opportunity for us to collaborate across our three campuses. Um, and in order to pursue membership, we knew that we had to find a source of funding. Well, just so happens every year we have this grant called the Chief Librarian Innovation Grant. Uh, this grant is specifically for project teams to explore, test, and assess the impact of innovative initiatives. So it was perfect. We put together that proposal and at our, in April 2019, that's when we found out that our proposal was accepted. Uh, the budget was made available to us in May 1st, 2019, and uh, we Im immediately applied for gold tier membership. Uh, we found that gold tier membership worked for us because of the size and it automatically gave us access to instructor training, which was highly beneficial, which you will hear from the other panelists. Um, and I would say the largest, uh, the grant item that was probably, you know, uh, was the largest item on our budget was the membership cost, but it was absolutely worth it. Uh, and the first thing we did after receiving the grant was organize instructor training. Um, and I'm going to just pass this on to the rest of our panelists. Our second question is, from a staff perspective, what was the most valuable part of taking part in this pilot project? So I will pass it on to Sarah and Kyla. Thanks, Rachel. So for me, knowing that we had signed on uh, with a membership really helped cement that this was worth my time and something to pursue and that, you know, just recognizing that it was important um, to the institution. And what I really liked uh, when I was going into the instructor training was that since we were all part of the same institution, albeit from different libraries and you know, from different backgrounds, we all had that common point of reference uh, when we started out. So we all knew the, the U of Toronto way, you know, how, how we approach things. And so we had that, that common framework and, and starting point that we could share 
when we were going through the experience. However, since we are such a large and distributed system, um, it also meant that it was a great opportunity to meet and interact with other people that we might not necessarily interact with on a day-to-day -day basis or see face-to-face. -face. In, in my case, I've been with the university for a little over 10 years. And um, I'm sure, you know, you get those emails all the time from people, but just, you know, it's like, oh, that's what you look like. That's who you are. You know, really, I hadn't had an opportunity in, in a lot of the cases to actually put a face to the name. So it was a really, you know, quick, immediate sense of building community uh, when we got to get together in the same room. Obviously, these were pre-COVID times, so we were actually able to meet in person to do the instructor training. Um, so, you know, going through that experience together with um, a series of other individuals was immediately a bonding ex experience uh, for me. Um, also, because we, when we went through, we made sure to include, or the organizing committee made sure to include a wide variety of uh, individuals, um, then we, um, also had not just um, professionals who are working in the library, but we also made sure to include students. So I found that really meaningful for me because, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you've been at it year after year and you, you just get beaten down a little bit. So whenever I'm in a room with new and emerging professionals or, or students, it really helps rejuvenate things. And it, it moved me from a point where I was, you know, always the, the teacher teaching the student. Here we were together on the same playing field, learning together. So that was a really nice and rewarding experience for me to see new perspectives on, on things and new approaches to teaching when we were going through. And as I said, really build that, that sense of community. And that sense of community was reinforced after the, the training session as we went through the checkout process. So knowing that others in my home institution who I now had met face to face, um, that you know I could reach out to them for support. And Jordan, one of the um, organizers, was there, you know, a great source of inspiration and just being like, you can do it, keep going through, you know, just just one more step and then you're there. Oh, and she must have known I was talking about her and Jordan's <laughs> joining us right now. So, you know, just knowing that we had that local connection that we could reach out to people who had gone through the training process or others who were in the same experience um, going through in that same environment as us right now was really helpful. And then knowing that that would be sustained through our listserv and through planning the workshops right away, as I said, because we had signed on for that membership was a really useful um, experience from my point as, as a staff member in the University of Toronto library system. Kyla? Yeah, um, I would agree with everything Sarah said. The community building aspect was wonderful, just meeting and building relationships with colleagues across the libraries and campuses. I didn't know Sarah before this, you know, like it's a, it's a very spread out campus, so it was nice to bring people together. Um, for me personally, I really appreciated the solid foundation in pedagogy specifically for adult education that the Carpentries Instructor Training offers uh, because it is different than teaching children or teaching in like a classroom where people are forced to be there. Um, I have some previous education training and there was no discussion of how to talk to adults, how to get them um, up to speed with skills that they want to learn but are maybe a little bit afraid of. Um, and I really appreciate that the Carpentries Training approaches that provides really good scaffolds for uh, us to build a curriculum around and I find that that is applicable even beyond the specific Carpentries curriculum. Um, I mostly work internally at my library so I don't do a lot of formal teaching um, but we're going to be moving to a new library system in January and we have a lot of training that we need to develop and then deliver around that and it's going to be different now because it's online um, but a lot of the Carpentries principles around like ensuring that people have some opportunities for guided practice and then to think back on what they did and how they understand that and then apply it again, um, things like that. Um, checking in to make sure everybody's on the same page regularly, having the helpers around for one-on-one -on -one assistance as we move through the class um, and the material. Um, I think these are all principles that are 
fairly uh, useful in other contexts as well. Um, so I think that's been a really great tool that we learned from our Carpentries instructor training. Um, I also want to say I appreciate all the information that uh, Greg Wilson and the other Carpentries uh, leaders have shared uh, throughout this work from home period about how to how to teach online, how to run meetings, how to um, do all these things um, in our new and strange situation. Um, and I think that's part of, well, going back to the community, even outside of our being part of the broader Carpentries community um, has helped develop a lot of these skills for us as well. And I think that's a really great uh, value. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kyla. I'm actually going to take us to the next uh, question. And this is going to be directed to Angel. From a student perspective, what was the most valuable part of taking part in this pilot project? Okay. Um, thanks, Rachel. As a student, I gained a lot of practical skills and leadership opportunities that I really hadn't been exposed to throughout my studies in library science. I feel like learning how to provide technical instruction or deliver a program or a workshop is just so relevant to the profession. And Carpentry's training was the ideal environment to develop these sorts of skills because it was low stress, it was friendly and very accessible. I also mastered some new technical skills myself while preparing to teach these lessons, which were turned out to be very useful in my own metadata work at the library. And I also found it very rewarding to just teach these technical skills to my own peers who wanted to supplement their LIS education with um, hands-on practical skills. Uh, as everyone else mentioned, being a part of the community was also very impactful for me. I am a part of a couple of different uh, professional associations, but I feel like Carpentries is very unique in that um, it's especially easy to get involved and make significant visible contributions, even as a student. And it's also a great way to expand, it was a great way to expand my professional network and get to meet people outside of my course, uh, my courses. I got to talk to people from across different campuses, meet graduate students pursuing really different, uh, graduate students with different faculties pursuing very interesting research and talk to librarians who are specializing in uh, different areas um, across University of Toronto. And student instructors are also able to introduce Carpentries to other institutions post-graduation, thus expanding the reach and the impact of the Carpentries. Uh, recently, I've undergone a couple of job interviews, and I can testify to the fact that many libraries are curious about the Carpentries and recognize the value of people who are certified instructors of software and technical skills um, in the workplace and are strongly interested in having this type of program at their own institution. Um, so to summarize, for me, the carpentry was, has really allowed me to grow personally and professionally and fill gaps in both technical skills and teaching experience that I think that I think are very valuable in the profession. Awesome. Thank you, Angel. I'm actually going to take us to the next panel question. Uh, from a committee perspective, what were some of the challenges of executing this pilot project? And I'm going to pass this over to Jordan. Hey everyone, um, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, thank you all for coming to the session. Um, Rachel also had suggested that I do like a little bit of a, a quick introduction because I missed that earlier. Um, so I'm a metadata librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries. Um, I also am a Carpentries instructor. I went through my instructor training at the same time as Rachel. Um, I believe that was in the summer of 2018. Um, and then I was involved in um, bringing the bringing the carpentries to the University of Toronto um, even though at that point I was switching from being a master's student I didn't know where I was going to be to then um, getting an offer to to stay on as a metadata librarian so Rachel's going to fill in a bunch of this session as well because or this section because there was a little bit of a gap in my knowledge when I thought I might not be returning to the University of Toronto um, but something that was really challenging for us um, from a committee perspective was the size of the University of Toronto. So the advantage of that is that, you know, are these grant sort of opportunities in place for us? Um, we have a huge pool of people to draw from, um, but this also makes things more complicated because we're trying to um, coordinate across three campuses. Um, there's 44 libraries. Um, I don't even, I'm sure, Rachel mentioned it at the beginning, but we have very, very many uh, graduate student programs as well, which we were drawing instructors from. And so 
finding a balance of who gets to participate um, and what they can bring to the university was a bit of a challenge. Um, but on that note as well, we did have some challenges with people power. So our committee started off pretty small. Um, it really started um, when Rachel and I and another colleague, Mei Chan, were chatting um, about, oh, maybe, maybe this is something we could bring to the university. And then it formed into a, a formal committee of five people. And by the end, we were at about nine people who were consistently part of this committee. Um, and we were trying to find people who would support the vision of the Carpentries, even if they didn't know it quite yet. So this was conversations with people we knew, hopefully reaching out to people we didn't even know, like the U of T Coders Club, um, and really just trying to spread the word because people were on board these sorts of buzzwords that we throw around in the Carpentries, but it was about introducing them to what the Carpentries themselves were actually doing. Um, also to something that might have been mentioned is the name the Carpentries doesn't always resonate with people. Sometimes they're like, well, what are you building? I don't, <laughs> um, I, I don't know what this is. And so it was also a bit of a branding exercise for some of us as well. Um, and we ended up, uh, one of the other committee members came up with this great like one page sort of cheat sheet of how to, how to really sell this to faculty, which was helpful for us. Um, but that was really only being introduced around the time that COVID hit, so we kind of got stalled. Um, and then, Rachel, do you maybe want to talk a little bit about candidate selection? Sure. And I'll come back to the diversity and inclusion part. Awesome. Uh, so another really big challenge was the fact that we only have 24 seats for all these people who are interested in becoming trained. Uh, so we put a call out for two weeks of applications. And in those two weeks, we got 79 applicants. So how do you whittle down 79 applicants to 24 seats? This was a really big challenge for us. Uh, the majority of applicants were actually graduate students. And this is from a wide range of disciplines. Uh, we, our next uh, noticeable group was actually library staff who were interested. Uh, so as a committee, we looked at criteria like, uh, did this person have experience teaching prior to carpentries? Uh, are they actively involved in other associations like Coperlib? Uh, and do we see sustainability in terms of after this person gets trained, do we see them giving back to their community? Do we see them continuously uh, staying active as an instructor uh, and being part of the Carpentries. Uh, and we also paid attention uh, to the disciplines because we know that Carpentries uh, can seem very science-based. So we looked at students who were coming from social sciences and humanities in particular. Um, and overall, we, we, we wanted to figure out if the, if the candidates that we selected, if they were people we would see uh, active in the community in the long run because this whole I want to say this whole initiative has been about community building uh, I'm gonna toss this back over to you Jordan um, and really that community building I think has been some of the most rewarding part um, but while we tried to build diversity and inclusion into our selection criteria of who got to participate in the instructor training portion of um, our membership I think we probably could have done a better job of like really putting this to the forefront intentionally because as Angel mentioned, um, being a Carpentries instructor does bring a lot of benefits for, for people when they're applying for jobs. Um, and so making this a little more intentional would have been helpful because our, our criteria, um, we were looking especially at like diversity of discipline um and including the three different campuses because um especially as sarah can probably attest to there's not a lot of communication between the three campuses um and because the downtown campus seems to get a lot of the publicity or funding i don't really know how else to describe it it seems like um that was an area we knew we could work on um but yeah we, we should have probably or I shouldn't say it that way. We definitely should have made diversity and inclusion more of a um, strong criteria, seeing if we did get so many applicants. Um, yeah, so uh, would not be a good time as well to talk about checkout support and sustainability. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Um, so not to just list these challenges on and on, just more so as a as something to be aware of if you're interested in pursuing Carpentries membership or um, if you're giving advice to somebody who is asking you about it. Um, something that is also, we found really helpful is when you're doing the instructor training portion to provide some sort of checkout support um, at your institution. Because so with Rachel and I, and then there were a few other instructors at our institution, um, we did some checkout support sessions like, do you want to practice teaching? Do you need to learn how to use Git? Um, and we had a fairly high uptake of those sessions. And it was also just helpful to sustain that like community building portion. Um, and so that's something that's really helpful to plan for, though it does, um, though it does also, uh, I guess, pose some difficulties when you're already running on kind of uh, people who are tapped out that have other commitments as well. So it's worth investing in, but it, it does take much more energy. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I'm actually going to take us to the last panel question, which is, uh, a question for all the panelists, really. Uh, do you have recommendations for other organizations interested in pursuing a membership? I, I can start if uh, any, I'll start, I'll, I mean, I'll kick, I'll kick us off with the question and then I'll pass it on to another one of the panelists. So uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that we, we are operating in really unprecedented times and we know it's really challenging to predict when resources are available, especially if you're interested in pursuing a membership. So I'm going to outline that maybe a grassroots effort is possible. There is an immense amount of benefit that comes with membership for sure. But at the same time, no one is stopping you from starting a grassroots effort without a membership. I'm not suggesting that this is a substitute for membership because membership will give you the push you need to get instructor training to get that people power at your institution. But it is possible to start an initiative uh, without membership. So this leads me to kind of point you to knowing your community. Uh, knowing your community needs. We at the University of Toronto are a larger institution. So gold tier, that really worked for us. Um, there are multiple tiers you can look at in terms of membership, uh, which means you don't necessarily have to aim for platinum or gold. You could also obtain a membership as part of consortia. Um, and it, I want to just say that this also points me to saying, talk to your community members, right? There are many ways you can go about this. Uh, who is interested? Uh, how long are you planning your membership for? Uh, how do you plan to sustain your membership? Uh, and looking at your portfolios, like do you have units in your institution that are well aligned? Do they have uh, similar values as what you're trying to bring? Um, and is there a way that you can position membership as mutually beneficial to these stakeholders? So in, in a nutshell, I guess I'm saying that, you know, talk to the people in your community, know a little bit more about who it is that you're going to uh, share this idea with and look at options like uh, other, look at the tier memberships that are available as well as looking at your other options like consortia membership. And if all of those are not an option, no one is stopping you from trying a grassroots uh, initiative and just bring together the people that you feel would uh, align well with the vision. I'm gonna pass this over to Sarah. Sure, thanks Rachel. Um, I'm going to just jump back to uh, what uh, Jordan was saying earlier about building diversity into your acceptance criteria, because I, I do think that that's a really um, meaningful thing in terms of building, you know, your, your cohort, if you're doing instructor training and thinking about who who you want uh, to, to have there at the table. So, you know, when you're looking at it, looking at at diversity and inclusion criteria, thinking about, you know, what makes you want to have of, of students because students, you know, they're really great. And as I said, I was really energized by, by interacting with graduate students, but also knowing that those students are also likely to not necessarily remain with the, with the institution in the long run too. So if we're talking about the, the local community, 
um, what impacts or what's your purpose. You know, if it's about training and providing skills and opportunity for new graduates, that's really great. But that also means that your, your pool of local instructors also will be changing uh, with, with time as well. And so, you know, looking at a mix of, of locations, different people in different stages of their career, people coming from different backgrounds, um, and, you know, if, if you're looking at this and, you know, how you're going to sustain it over time and, you know, is the plan to, um, once you, you build this, this community locally, how do you connect in and stay engaged with the larger uh, Carpentries community, I think is, is really important because while um, it's really great to know that we have people locally, it, you know, we, we don't operate independently, you know, this is a larger organization. Um, that that we're part of. So how do we uh, pull those resources and work with with other local institutions and, and other instructors and kind of combine all of those those resources uh, together. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm actually going to pass this on to Angel, who is going to talk a little bit about honorariums. Thanks, Rachel. I feel like our honorariums are a great idea to get your students more involved. Students have to make some sacrifices in um, things like time and sometimes even finances in order to teach lessons and get training and things like that. Um, when I when I was receiving training and even when I was teaching my first workshop, I personally did have to make some adjustments in my work schedule and even think about uh, how to make it in time for class after teaching a carpentry's lesson or after finishing uh, part of the uh, after finishing training. Um, there's also sometimes um, you're, the students, as well as everyone else, need time to practice and prepare for their lessons, and that's time that students have to take out of studying or completing their assignments. Mm -hmm. um, so many students, of course, contribute to Carpentries voluntarily, unpaid, on an unpaid basis, and we're happy to do it. But I think honorariums would be a great way to recognize students' services and time commitments and potentially reduce some barriers um, that may prevent students from being more involved in delivering Carpentries lessons. Thank you, Angel. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to Kyla, who can speak a little bit about community building. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, part of what made working through the certification process work so well was that we had people on hand, like Jordan and Rachel, who had done this training and could help talk us through it. And because we had become a bit of a community through the training. Um, like Angel completed her training or like her certification a week or two before me. So she told me what her experience was. So I wasn't going in totally blind, which was really nice. Um, and um, yeah, so like making the most of the community that you've created through doing this. Um, for me, uh, through the training, you know, in the small group exercises, I kept getting thrown together with uh, this other woman who it turns out works literally one floor above me. I had never met her before. Um, but now we're, we've done uh, an online carpentries workshop together and we're doing another one next week. Um, and so it just opens up some, uh, some new ways to collaborate with both peers that you work closely with and those that you've never met before. Um, and I think that's really wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Kyla. I'm going to pass it over to Jordan if you have any other remarks. Oh, you're on mute, Jordan. Yeah. Um, awesome. So I, I guess maybe a few things to touch on. Like Angel was saying um, with the honorariums, that was something we only really thought to offer right near the, the end of... Um, okay, sorry, let me take a step back. So um, as you may have heard, we did this instructor training, and then um, in January of this year, we did a workshop at the one Scarborough campus. We did one at our downtown St. George campus, and we did another workshop um, at our Mississippi campus. And it wasn't until the end, well, the last two workshops, I believe, that we started offering honorariums for students who were teaching on those days. Um, and so it was something that we're glad we came to. It would have been nice to have that like all the way through and, and to be consistent with it. Um, and then like uh, Kyla was mentioning, we've had a lot of chance to either teach workshops. I know Kyla's teaching one online. 
um, and has done one already online, I believe. Um, and so we've developed like a nice community of practice, which is working really well, but we're a little uncertain with um, basically where we're going with our membership because a bunch of funding with COVID has changed. And so um, where the Carpentries at the University of Toronto is going to live is still a bit of a mystery for us. Um, and we've been trying different campus groups and trying different um, research organizations associated with the university. And, and we're still kind of sorting that out. Um, right now, what it means is, um, yeah, we have a pool of really well-qualified instructors who are eager to teach. I think we had about 75% of people who attended the instructor training complete the instructor checkout. Um, and we've had about, I'd say about 50% of them have taught either an individual lesson or a workshop. So we're doing quite well on that front, but uh, the sustainability is, uh, it, it, it's potentially going to be a challenge. Um, but something that maybe was touched on earlier, and this will be my last point, is that something that's great about membership is it also gave us a chance to really support financially what the Carpentries does as an or as an organization that says they value these things. So for us being able to, I see in the chat um, people posting the, the member frequently asked questions in the list of members, um, it made it a bit of an easier sell to administration saying, we believe in all of these things around digital literacy um, and facilitating these skills. Why should we not be a member? Um, why should we not like actually financially support these initiatives? So. Um, there's sort of a few different uh, like branding angles that you have to play, um, but we found the membership to be really well worth it, even though what that looks like in the future is still a little bit flexible. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I want to open the floor for any questions from our viewers and attendees. Uh, does anyone have any questions for any of our panelists or about the topic we've brought up today? Yes, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, hi, I'm Anaziat. I'm uh, from Brighton University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. So I was curious to know that Carpentries uh, provides the opportunity and they're uh, continually going through research material, latest trend, and they're up always updating the curriculum. So uh, how uh, did uh, University of Toronto uh, keep up with the changes? How are you managing and what was your experience? So to keep up with the latest research in, thank you. I, I can answer just how I'm I'm kind of maintaining is it's really just once you um, know the different communication channels. So as I said, like I I'm looking at the Slack channel. I regularly too also just go to the different like GitHub repositories and you know take a look through things and you know where I have the time and ability. You know like it's certainly my intention to uh, contribute back. As I said, you know like within the digital scholarship unit where I work, we're, we're a big fan of open source community. And, you know, it, it's not just a take relationship, it's a give and take. And so, I, and I think that goes along with membership is, you know, giving back to that community and that organization. So in terms of how, you know, I, I stay connected, it's really just carving out the time in, in my calendar to just, you know, take a, take a look at those pages see what's happening, you know, see what's gone from, a, oh, this was in development, now it's moved into this, you know, phase, or, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of teaching something, and maybe it's not even a formal Carpentries workshop, but I think, like, let's say I'm, I'm doing something, and it's on Open Refine, and I'm, I'm a science liaison librarian, so, oh, maybe I'll, I'll, instead of doing the library Carpentries Open Refine session, I'll take a look and see if there's been any changes in the ecology, you know, stream that they have within carpentry. So it's just, I think really just once you, you do become certified, or even if, if you're not at that stage yet, and you're just curious, it's just going to the resources that are available um, online and, and just making that commitment has, has been how I've managed to, I, I feel, stay connected to the Carpentries group. And whenever I find something, you know, that sounds particularly interesting to making sure um, that I amplify it uh, among, for example, our listserv or to colleagues that that I know would would find this interesting. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and I think Jordan, do you have a something to add? Yeah. Um, and so 
something that I'd like to add is that this is something we found with the varying levels of where people are at in their career and then becoming instructors. So for myself as a librarian, we do have a portion of our job related to research and a portion of our job related to services, I imagine your job would be as well. And so um, for me, I consider my work as a, a lesson maintainer with the Library Carpentry SQL, a way to stay involved with um, the maintainer community and some of those updates, while also then, um, yeah, sort of doing research on my own time that is related to these skills, but, but definitely tangential. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, are there any other questions for our panelists? I just wanted to highlight uh, while we're waiting, if anyone has any additional questions that Elizabeth Williams um, put out a shout on the chat um, to anyone who's interested in, in membership. She's the director of membership and she, she's got her contact information there. And uh, it sounds like she's happy to chat with anyone if, if they have any additional questions specifically around uh, Carpentry's membership. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm just gonna jump in very quickly to just give my heartfelt agreement and um, back up to everything that has been said here today. It's so amazing to see this coming together. I remember talking to Mei Chan, I was uh, taking a sick day. So I was sitting in my bed, but there was no other time that we could meet and she needed to put the grant in. And I yeah, remember sitting there and looking uh, out into the backyard and thinking about all the great places this could go. So it's amazing to see um, how, how this has happened and to meet all of you people. Um, and please, please do jump on my calendar. Anyone, I love talking about organizations. I love talking about the carpentries. I will talk your ear off. Um, please give me an excuse to jump in the trenches with you and figure out how to pitch things to your administration and um, what a community for the carpentries might look like at your organization. Um, it's my favorite part of my job. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll get to talk to some of you soon. And thank you so much to the presenters on this panel. This has been so amazing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, I, I see another question from Benson. Are you able to measure time savings as a result of your membership since you have a better knowledge of materials and teaching practices? This can help make a stronger case for membership. It could have been a comment, but <laughs> if anyone on the panel has something to add to that, please feel free. I'd just like to mention, I don't think we've measured that yet, but I do agree with you. That's something I think we've all found is we, the more we, the more we teach, the better we know the lessons, the less we need to obsess in the two days before we teach. Um, one thing that uh, would be really helpful with that, like you're saying, is to be able to uh, talk about it from a staff perspective about the time saved when we're, when we're preparing to teach. Something that we have been measuring is the amount of participation when we do host workshops as well as the wait lists that we have um, to show that there really is a need for this. Um, something that I wouldn't say is contentious but is a little difficult in our university is that we do have a really strong cohort of librarians who do teach data skills or um, similar skills to what are, are taught in the carpentries. Um, and so initially there was sort of a concern of like, well, will you be taking away these teaching opportunities from these people? They're already doing an excellent job. What's, what's the value here? And I think we've really been able to demonstrate that we just can't meet the demand. Um, even with a pool of approximately 20 instructors, we're still not meeting demand. So, um, yeah, time savings will be probably a good thing to measure in the future, but as far as I know, we haven't yet. Um, Thanks, Jordan, and thank you for that question and thought, Benson. Uh, is there anyone else in the chat or of the attendees that has a question? There's one in the etherpad as well. Oh, okay, oh, I better look at that one. Um, <laughs> let's see. It might have been already touched on. It's my institution already teaches non carpentries branded technical workshops. In this case, what are the benefits of membership? Okay. Does anyone want to take this one? I'd like I to add that um, 
it you're being you're part of a larger community and as a membership as part of membership you also get support from the carpentries to help you organize and coordinate any workshops uh, at your institution uh, and i i want to say that also being a member and seeing how many other institutions out there that also support the same vision as the carpentries uh, i guess i'm i'm coming from a branding perspective as well for you to kind of build a case with your stakeholders you kind of want you're able to show your stakeholders that they're part of a larger community and all these other institutions and communities support this vision of making accessible training uh, to uh, for and fostering a diverse and inclusive environment um, I, I I just feel like maybe it goes back to me and uh, feeling that being part of a community is extremely important and you we also have um, we have access to a larger wider community to also reach out for instructors um, also when you're looking for helpers I, I've seen international calls for uh, instructors in other places globally um, and I might just be rambling here but if anyone else on the panel wants to add but for sure we have seen a huge benefit at our institution I really want to push that that uh, yes, you know, there is the grassroots approach, but with membership, it comes with the extra support, the community, and uh, just the, yeah, the, the, the support of community. I, I would just echo that, you know, if, if you're already teaching non-carpentries technical workshops, it's, it's back to the infrastructure and, and the approach, the pedagogical approach, the community driven, you know, just the support for like, oh, we're teaching a workshop keeping that lesson plan up to date and with changes that happen, especially when it comes to software or technical skills, they're, they're constantly changing environment. So not having to just put all the work on yourself, but knowing that you're, you're working together with the community. And when it comes to membership, it's, it's that support really that's in, inherent uh, with the activities that, that you're undertaking. Like, as we said before, you know, if, if, membership is in something that you're quite ready to go to you know just the fact that as because the carpentries exist there are these really great active lesson plans um, that are constantly going through revisions um, that are teaching you know a wide variety of skills so so that's really just you know helping to distribute some of the workload um, that um, might otherwise have to be you know on on you or whoever's teaching at um, your own institution, these, these non-carpentries workshops. I also want to add with Gold Tier membership, uh, we got instructor training, right? That helped us build a pipeline to have instructors in our community without having to figure out how are we going to get all these people trained and then have to figure out the logistics of, okay, we have to send, we have to figure out how we're gonna get those resources in order to send X amount of people to training, which is in X location. So that, that was a really big plus for us, was having 24 trained instructors at our institution so that now we're able to feed the demand for teaching workshops. Uh, Kyla's teaching, uh, I, I've seen Sarah active too, to signing up for uh, teaching. Even in a COVID world, we're still running workshops virtually, and those instructors that got trained are now teaching right now. So that that's another thing that was a plus from our membership. We we got a whole huge uh, pool of instructors that are now filling the pipeline uh, of our demands to teach. Um, and just one last thing to to add about why membership. Or, or sorry, Kyla, you were gonna go. No, no, go ahead. Um, all right. um, the, the big benefits I, I saw from having a membership versus doing the instructor training on my own was that, um, as has been mentioned, the community, um, but also the institution had a chance to kind of put its money where its mouth is. Um, we also saw having a pool of instructors. That was the big thing because instructor training otherwise was a wait list of about a year, I believe. Um, and so we were able to get people the instructor training really quickly. And then, um, oh, bye Sarah. Bye Sarah. <laughs> um, but then, 
I totally lost my thought. I'm so sorry. Um, Membership's great because yeah. we have <laughs> so many instructors able to now to fill that pipeline. Do you have something to add, Kyla? I was going to say, like, um, even if you're already teaching technical workshops, for us, the membership and the instructor training and the community we built out of this, like, it functions a little bit like a mini conference where you can go and, like, refresh or learn new ways of teaching, new ways of approaching problems in your classroom or in your, your delivery or anything. Um, and that there's, there's always value in that. I feel like we're, we are all constantly learning um, and it just provides a really great opportunity for that. Angel, do you have any, do you want to add anything or Jordan, do you want to add anything? I just feel like, um, yeah, like it was just really beneficial to have like talking about, you know, reducing barriers and everything. Like I really admire Jordan for like flying away to like two carpentries instructor training by having it like um, where I was at that time. It was just super convenient and I don't know, I might have, you know, I might have gotten trained if like an opportunity came up and like um, it was nearby and I could make it there with like my scheduling, my classes and everything. But yeah, I feel like it's just another way to reduce barriers for students to get involved as well. Awesome. I also remember the thought <laughs> um, was just that for us, membership was important because the library sees itself as being sort of like this strategic bridge in between um, the university and students and the skills that they need to learn. And so if you're pursuing membership as, let's say, um, like a community of scientists at your, at your school, your goals might be a little bit different. And it might be more about directly meeting the needs of, let's say, your incoming graduate students who are going to be teaching your seminars and you want to make sure that they have a strong foundation or maybe you do want to open things up more broadly and work across departments or um, there was a session last week or a week and a half ago at Carpentry Con at home about consortial membership and so um, ours was very like context dependent why it was so good for us but with a little bit of play membership does have a lot of benefits for for a lot of different groups as well. So thank you, Jordan. Uh, is there any more questions for panelists? I, I don't see anything in the Zoom chat, but uh, let me have a look at the Etherpad. I don't see any additional questions there. If I may reiterate one point, uh, the opportunity for uh, teaching. So if uh, so, if there are instructor. Uh, to, they're trained instructors in one institution, they get the call for teaching in other workshops in other institutions, that's a great opportunity. And inviting others to one's institution, also having the mix uh, provides an exciting learning environment and bring in fresh new views. So I think uh, it's a great opportunity for the uh, people or staff and students in the campus to gain some experience teaching in other places. Also having the opportunity to which you might increase their experience and this uh, will help in sharing knowledge more because even if you're maintaining the curriculum well, uh, having fresh new perspectives helps in accelerate. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, Maybe any... a quick question. Oh, is there a question? Sure. Thank you, Rachel. Now, my question is, sorry, I joined later um, also from the question is, uh, I hear a lot about um, carpentries organizations which are kind of academic based, like in universities, things like that. I'm wondering if there are situations where we have carpentries in organization, research organizations that do have postgraduate programs, researchers within the institution, but don't formally have their academic system. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to rephrase it. So are, are, are you saying would carpentries fit into the context of a non-academic institution setting? Is that kind of where? Okay. Okay. So um, would carpentries fit in a non? Uh, I, let's see. Does anyone on the panel have a use case? Oh, Kyla. Okay. Um, so when I took my first carpentries classes, it was through a, um, well, it was in a public library. Um, sorry, we all come from a library background, so that's still gonna be my example. Um, and so it was an academic, everyone there was worked in libraries. Um, 
and a lot of the carpentry skills can be applied to the work that we do, like cleaning up data, um, navigating file systems. Um, we're big into the library carpentry there. Um, so I don't think it has to be geared towards research or academia specifically. There's a lot that's relevant just for day-to-day -day work. Thank you. And awesome. yes, I can definitely jump in with some examples. Thank you for that, Kyla. I hadn't thought of the public library example. That is a great one. Um, but also the peer-to-peer um, -peer instruction, I think, is what enables carpentries to work within an academic environment or a completely research-based environment. We have members um, who are uh, part of the national labs. Um, yes, also companies. Um, Regeneron has run a couple of our workshops and it, yeah, and NASA. Thank you, Anna Sheehan. Um, yeah, so actually a lot because the strength of the instructor training is that it teaches people who potentially have no teaching background, who have never taught before, even though a lot of them have taught before, how to teach. So you can take someone um, who is not in an academic setting where they're teaching undergraduate classes or graduate classes or in a library setting where they're, they're helping uh, researchers on a daily basis um, and prepare them to teach their peers about doing research if that makes sense. So yes, there are a lot of examples of this, as Anna Giat has said, um, and I think that's why it works. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for that question, Uso. Um, are there any other questions for the panelists? I don't see any more in the Zoom chat, and I don't think the Etherpad has any other remaining questions. Uh, I think this might be a cue for us to wrap up this session. So I, I really want to thank all the organizers of Carpentry. Oh, oh, we have a question. We have a question. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, I keep asking questions. Uh, so the Carpentry uh, instructor training, there is a requirement to teach a number of workshops and uh, to be a regular in activities. So as you have a number of instructors, say you said uh, 25 or more who are doing uh, teaching regularly and you have probably 70 or so many. So how do you main, uh, manage that they keep their memberships current and their uh, certifications current? So how are they meeting the requirements and how uh, manageable it is? Thank you. Uh, Jordan, do you, do you wanna add something or? Sure. I see you <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> That's why I, I have something I could add, but if you want to take this one, go for it, Rachel. Um, I want to say that we, we probably could do a better job of tracking how active our instructors are. But one thing we have been tracking is how many instructors have been certified. And since training, as Jordan said earlier, 75% of them have uh, passed are fully certified and we see them active on our mail list. So I guess I can't really answer in, in terms of metrics, but I can say that they are active at, through our communication channels. We have a mailing list where if anyone needs a helper or instructor, they just fire away, send that email. And I have, I have not seen any of those emails not answered, right? We have uh, Kyla's who's teaching virtual sessions this month. Uh, Jordan uh, is also teaching and helping. I myself am also teaching uh, and helping for virtual sessions uh, this, this uh, August. And thanks Elizabeth for that kudos. Kudos to you too. Um, and we, we are, if you check the Carpentries pages for upcoming workshops, feel free to sign up as well. <laughs> uh, that we, we, we are active uh, in terms of, and I think from the committee perspective too, we also are looking for opportunities to keep our community active. So again, I can't, I can't really speak on the metric side because that's not something we've been keeping track of, but I know for a fact that our community is very, very active. And Jordan, if you have something to add to that. Uh, I was just gonna say that um, for anyone who doesn't know it, the instructor training portion to become a Carpentries instructor, you go through this two day training, they have these three sort of components that you have to do and then you're officially certified. They're like a teaching demonstration, um, a community discussion, um, and then a contribution to a lesson or just some feedback on a lesson. 
Um, and so again, it's been easy to, easier to track those things than continued involvement. Um, and so what we've been kind of relying on is there's probably about, I'd say about five or six people who are sort of like super instructors and like super involved. And they'll be the ones who are really initiating things on the listserv um, and within our community. And we're sort of relying on being able to like, like get a feel for um, if people are responding and who's responding. And I know um, because we had the in-person instructor training, it's been a little bit easier for us to kind of follow up with with people if we haven't heard from them in a while and just be like hey how's it going like I really liked meeting you back in July what's up um so it's been really informal but we we have sort of had some people drop off that they either haven't used the the instructor training or they just don't feel they have time to teach right now which is understandable um but as Elizabeth was saying in the chat like 75 percent is we thought it was really good. Glad that Elizabeth thinks so too. Um, if you do something, you'll probably get similar, but it does require quite a bit of work on the like organizing side to keep prodding people, or you need to have some like super engaged users or like super engaged instructors. Yeah, and I, I just want to add from the community perspective, uh, before COVID, we had planned like a little uh, a post training kind of party get together. So from a committee perspective, we, we also try to look for opportunities to engage the community. And I think that helps as well for us to kind of get a sense of how active instructors are, are they, and, you know, in terms of, you know, are they teaching and uh, what, what needs are there in terms of what topics and subjects are in demand. Uh, and as Jordan said, yeah, it, it does require that organiza organizational effort to kind of keep a pulse on what's happening in your community. I feel like I've said community so many times today though, but <laughs> but it is really like one of the really, really big benefits of membership has been community and it's heart to everyone <laughs> in the Carpentries community. Uh, is there any other questions for our panelists? Okay, I, I don't see questions in the ether pad or Zoom chat, so it might be a sign to wrap up. Uh, I just want to thank all the uh, organizers of CarpentryCon. Thank you for having us speak, uh, having us today to speak. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. Thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, listen to us speak about uh, membership. Uh, I, I hope you got some idea about what membership can bring to your institution. Uh, as you know, it's it's been a wonderful journey for us uh, as being part of uh, the, the Carpenters community with the membership. Uh, does uh, Kyla, Jordan, or Angel have any parting thoughts left? If not, then I'm going to say thank you everyone for attending and uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our information is on the etherpad and uh, thank you for attending. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, so thank you, the presenters. Thank you, everyone, for attending. There is a, a feedback link in the chat and also in Etherpad. Please fill up the feedback form.